Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Henry Kerr. I'm the economics editor at The Economist. Uh, welcome back. And I'm delighted to be moderating this panel here today at the Greenwich Economic Forum. In the last session, we were talking about the economic outlook for the US and for the world uh, after the election and also the, the news about the vaccine this morning. In this panel, we're going to be talking about the extraordinary policy measures governments and central banks have taken this year as they've sought to protect their economies and their people from the impact of the pandemic and what the future uh, are, uh, is for those measures, as well as uh, what private sector companies can do to contribute to the uh, pandemic relief effort. Uh, before we get started, uh, a bit of housekeeping. If you're having any trouble accessing the content today, please make sure you're using our uh, recommended browser, Google Chrome. We will be taking questions throughout this panel. Uh, please use the uh, question and answer function to submit them and I will do my best to share them with our panelists. And you can a reminder that you can take advantage of the networking uh, features uh, by connecting with other attendees and sponsors during the uh, networking breaks. Uh, we have a great panel today to discuss the uh, uh, policy response to the pandemic around the world. Uh, we have Dylan Pillay, who's the chief executive of Temasek, uh, the Singaporean uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, we have Governor Roberto Campos Neto, the Governor of the Central Bank of Brazil. And we have Dr. Sarah Alade, uh, the Special Advisor to the President of Nigeria on Finance and the Economy and former Central Bank of Nigeria Deputy Governor. And we're particularly grateful to Dr. Alade for stepping in at the last minute. Uh, we were going to have the uh, Minister Zainab Ahmed. Unfortunately, she, she was called away into a meeting. Uh, so uh, we're, we're very glad. Uh, uh, that we that we have a replacement. So I'm going to start uh, with uh, Governor Neto. Please, could you walk us through uh, Brazil's crisis response this year and the thinking behind your emergency economic policy making? Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here. So I'll probably start saying that uh, from uh, 2019 to go a little bit before the crisis, we were embarking in a plan that was basically to reinvent the state uh, using private means. So it was about reforms. It is still about reforms, um, about uh, cutting the size of the state and the measures that we're trying to implement. We did a, a, a huge social security reform, um, which was one of the biggest expenditures that we had. The second one was interest rate on the debt. So we cut interest rates to the lowest uh, ever. Um, and we also we did a lot of reforms in the way uh, to improve uh, the business efficiency, um, cutting subsidies and things like that. Then the COVID came. And basically, when you look at uh, how the countries uh, deal, dealt with the, the crisis, we can separate everything into five uh, categories. The first one is monetary policy, in which we lower policy from 4.5 to 2%, which is the lowest ever in Brazil. Um, the second one is the measures that are um, to protect the financial market, so liquidity plus capital. Um, and we did, uh, we were the first central bank to release liquidity, even before the pandemic was uh, declared pandemic by the OMS. Uh, we did 17% of GDP in terms of liquidity. Uh, and in terms of capital, we did 20% of GDP. So it was the biggest injection of liquidity and capital uh, in, in the emerging market. When we look at those measures, we divide it in three objectives. The first one is market stabilization, make sure we don't have any market disruption. The second one is to make sure that we have liquidity in the system to cross uh, this period of pandemic. And the third one is uh, part of what was done was directed to some areas. So we gave liquidity as long as banks, for example, gave loans to SMEs and things like that. So first monetary policy, second liquidity plus capital. The third one is credit programs. That was uh, a lot of programs that were designed um, with the central bank, central bank and the government. And on the credit program, basically we also divided in three. Uh, part of the credit program was designed for large companies and large sectors. And those are, you know, guarantee funds that you can leverage. So uh, kind of a first loss uh, structure. 
The second one was direct lending uh, into SMEs, and we had uh, four or five programs that only attend SMEs. And we also had programs for the very, very small companies, uh, which we call micro companies. And those were using the, those credit card machines. And, and so um, a lot of these programs are still uh, have still a lot of absorption because there are there big programs and the companies have not taken all the credit that are available. Uh, so monetary policy, liquidity credit, and then tax avoidance and tax delays, which was done. It's pretty much what uh, most of other countries have done too. And we had a huge program of income tra transfer. We had a, a program of income transfer that was so big that basically replaced all the income loss. So if you look at the total mass, mass of wages for 2020, it's unchanged basically. So the, those are the five, the, the, the main programs that we've done. Um, it's very important that, uh, that, that to, to, to summarize that the effect of this is that we have a, uh, you know, a robust recovery. Uh, we see that uh, a lot of the money that, that was uh, placed in those programs are, are still available. Um, and we think uh, uh, with the design that we did, we attended most of the sectors. Thank you. Uh, Governor, in, in advanced economies, there's been a lot of talk about the blurring of the lines between fiscal and monetary policy and the difficulty in telling what's liquidity provision and uh, what is stimulus to the economy. Do you think that that is uh, an issue in emerging markets like Brazil as well? It was a central piece in our debate. The first thing that we, that we thought is, what is the job of the central bank? And what is the job of the government in the case in Brazil, Minister of, of Economics? And basically, the way we divide it is everything that is liquidity and capital and monetary policy is the job of the central bank. And so those programs were exclusively from the central bank. Everything that is income transfer uh, and everything that is taxes is related to the government. And on the credit lines, we work together, but the money comes from, um, from the government, from the treasury. So we don't cross the line into doing fiscal policy. That was very important for us. It is our belief that once you cross this line, um, there is a huge danger that you start losing credibility. So everything was designed in this way that I just mentioned. Thank you. Dr. Alade, in uh, Nigeria, you face the twin challenges of the pandemic and a big decline in oil prices. Uh, can you walk us through how that effect has affected your economic policy response to the pandemic? Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ben. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, even before the pandemic, we had uh, issues. We were just uh, coming out of a uh, uh, recession, although we had had some positive growth for uh, for some few quarters, but it wasn't uh, the growth was not strong enough. So it was all in this kind of macroeconomic instability. We were also having rising inflation and so on that the uh, pandemic came in, then COVID-19. So what we had done after that was that, uh, the first thing was that the president inaugurated a committee, you know, to, to look at the health issue, advice. We, we call it the presidential task force on COVID-19 which was monitoring developments and then advising government. And on the part of the uh, fiscal, the budget needed to be amended. We had had uh, a budget that became more realistic because of the COVID-19. One was the health issues, as you said, and then the second one was that the main um, revenue source of the government had uh, become challenged. You know, nobody was importing anymore, the lockdown, had led to uh, business shutdowns, and we were not even able to uh, get, uh, you know, enough revenue from the the oil. So we faced those three challenges. But what we did was then to amend the budget and push funds into the health uh, sector because we had uh, the the health infrastructure wasn't the best. So we needed to 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 push money into that sector so that we can protect lives. And then also protect livelihood by changing, reprioritizing what we had in the budget. What we then did was to make sure that the capital expenditure, productive side of the economy was protected. We didn't want to cut the budget on that side, but for uh, recurrent revenue and things that can be, uh, can be 
undertaken in future, we decided to uh, move money from that side and then reinvest the the the, uh, the productive sector. We also had, uh, apart from the direct intervention into the health sector, which we have both by the government as well as private sector, we have to acknowledge the role of the private sector as well. We also had tax relief for MSMEs, the, the micro, small and medium enterprises to enable them protect jobs. Those who were hard hit by this, by the lockdown and by the, um, you know, the fact that the revenue wasn't forthcoming and some of the things government should be doing, we were not doing. So they, we decided to give tax relief to enable them protect the jobs that they have, including big companies as well, which we know have been uh, affected. So, and then there was also palliatives, which we gave to the most vulnerable in the society. Government had to do that. We did uh, also some income transfer, and then there was feeding of some of the children who were in school. Even outside the school, you needed to give some income to the most vulnerable of the society. So those were the ways we had uh, done. The, the aim throughout was uh, protecting life and then protecting, I mean, uh, jobs so that people can go back to job. Thank you. How, how do you think about the uh, level of fiscal capacity you have to provide support, both humanitarian support and fiscal stimulus to the economy. We've seen a, quite a big divergence between advanced economies and emerging markets this year in terms of the amount of stimulus. So how do you think about the amount of uh, capacity you have uh, uh, to, to do what's necessary during this crisis? There, there, there's not much uh, fiscal space to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, we had to borrow from the World Bank, from the IMF for this, uh, for COVID support uh, issues. And we also had the central bank coming in to do some of the provision of liquidity, as well as uh, reduce interest rates so that those who have loans can then, um, you know, uh, it, it can be paid back easier. No, it's, it, it wasn't, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's not, as uh, we would have expected, but we were able to get resources from outside to be able to do some of the things that we needed to do in the budget. For the first time in many years, our budget deficit went above uh, 3%. Usually budget, the law had fixed it for not more than 3% of GDP. But uh, in case of emergencies, we had to, and I think we went up to about 3.6, 3.7% of GDP this time, which was allowed because of the emergencies that we had. Uh, Dylan Pillay, a, a lot of focus this year has been on the extraordinary government support that we've seen. But what can corporates do to contribute to the uh, fight against the pandemic? What have you been doing? And how does that fit in the picture of the, the sort of societal response. Uh, thank you for that, Henry, and thank you for inviting me to this conference. Uh, governments are, are doing what they can, and I think corporate, this is a time for corporates to also weigh in and do their bit, because it's about making sure that the communities thrive and are able, first of all, to survive and then thrive, because only if the communities thrive can we as companies prosper. And I think that we have to be mindful in this pandemic um, no one is safe until everyone is safe, and we all have to figure out what we can do to attain that objective. Um, in the context of Tomasek, uh, what we did was to work with our companies to see what we could do uh, in addressing the issues and impact of the pandemic in five ways. The first was to ensure that we had the right diagnostics, uh, which was critical in the context of, uh, of testing. Uh, the second was to ensure that we had in place uh, provisions for containment and contact tracing. And so we came up with, uh, with some technological uh, inventions, innovations for that. Uh, the third was to ensure that treatment protocols were, were being put in place and new treatment protocols that were being discovered uh, in other places were, were made available in the communities where we operated. Uh, the fourth was to make sure that there was sufficient equipment for prevention and protection. That meant also masks, shields, sanitizers, etc., all of which uh, are very, very relevant in the context of preventing the spread of, of the virus. 
And the fifth part was what we call enablement, which is to ensure that we were doing things not just for, the, for our own community, but for other countries which had need. And therefore, that was part of our donation drive. And we, uh, we sent masks and PPEs and, and other things to about 40 different countries around the world. And I think that's important. And, and we were helped in this by our portfolio companies, not just in Singapore, but around the world. All, all who could weighed in to participate in that effort, putting aside the focus on, uh, on profitability to see what they could do to do good and do right. I think that's important because at the end of the day, uh, you know, we really, it really brings home the issue of stakeholder capitalism versus uh, shareholder primacy, where uh, the duty of the company extends beyond that of the shareholders to the communities in which they operate, to the employees uh, and, to, and to other stakeholders, uh, you know, which are relevant. And I think we saw a lot of that in the context of the last eight months and, and the pandemic. And, uh, and I, you know, as much as gov governments have their duty to society and the citizens, I think we as companies have to do our bit uh, to, to complement what governments are doing uh, in ensuring that our communities are able to get through this pandemic. Do you think that is uh, applies to the somewhat unique position of of, of Tomasek and uh, your role within Singapore? Is that something you would advocate uh, across the corporate spectrum? So we are very mindful that companies have different pressures right now. I mean, we own we own the majority shareholding in an airline. Uh, there's not much the airline can do uh, when 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 the business has fallen off by by 96, 97 percent, especially when we don't have a domestic market. But what, what happened was that the airline, uh, as a result of funding that they received, was able to maintain employment uh, of a significant number of their, of, of their workforce. And that workforce was also deployed to help in national objectives. So I think that for us as a shareholder, if we put in capital to support the business of a company, and the company uses that capital you know, wisely, which includes uh, the use of part of the capital for purposes of enabling the community, I think that's a win-win for everyone. Now, Tomasic and other sovereign wealth funds and, and, and other investment companies, uh, you know, are able to make available capital in a way that can catalyze, uh, you know, the efforts of companies or enable the efforts of companies uh, and who can be in partnership with us. So in that sense, uh, there, there is an ability to address the, the impact much more than most companies can do so, given that they have they're facing the brunt of the pandemic in their business models and, and in, their, in their business environment. So I accept that, that, uh, that those of us who have uh, you know, that capital available uh, may, may have to step up more than those who are challenged by this pandemic. Governor Nessa, can I bring you in on this point? Because a lot of central bankers have been asking the question, uh, what is the appropriate role for central banks in uh, fighting climate change, say, uh, but you could expand that to other social issues. And I think it's a live debate at the moment, the extent to which uh, central banks and their bond buying programs, say, should take account of other policy goals. Uh, wh what's your view on that? And, and uh, how much should central banks be looking at these sorts of ethical issues when thinking about their liquidity interventions? No, I, th I think the, the, the important point here is uh, what, are, what, are, what is the main characteristics of this recovery? When we look at the, the recovery, uh, we see three characteristics that I think are common everywhere. The first one is that the society is demanding the recovery to be inclusive and sustainable. The second one is that it's, it's basically, basically so far in terms of where the money is going, a technology-led recovery. And the last component is uh, what's going to happen to the way we see international trade and the global value chain. So if you go to the first part, which is, I think, related to your question, um, I think the society demands uh, the recovery to be inclusive and to be uh, sustainable. Every country is talking about the basic income program or a negative tax or a voucher program or you know things like that um it's it's very easy to see that what this crisis have done is has accelerated uh, technology to a point in which we're going to reach a new equilibrium in my opinion um that we're going to have um more companies in technology displacing uh, labor, especially the informal labor is already happening in the service sector in Brazil and many other emerging market countries. 
Um, the change in, in the consumption pattern will accelerate that, and we are re already seeing that. Some of it is going to go back to what it was before, but some won't. So when we look at this cycle, at the end, we're going to have um, consumption going back very fast. Um, in most cases, the, the GDP is going to go back fast, um, but employment won't. And employment won't because the technology acceleration that is being behind uh, the recovery is uh, it was so fast that it gives no time uh, for this, uh, especially the informal workers, to be uh, allocated somewhere. So what that also means is that governments will need to do more programs, and this means more debt, which refers back to our first question, which is do we have fiscal space for that to go much longer? And probably the answer is, is at least in emerging markets, the answer is probably no in a lot of emerging markets, especially Brazil, which has a very high debt. And so I think uh, the, the sustainability and the inclusiveness uh, um, have to be uh, the main, main, main points. Um, but also, how do you do that with private money? How do you do more private and less public? How do you make sure that you have a sustainable agenda that brings in the private sector so that the investments are at least shared or in, in a large part uh, sponsored by private initiatives. We just launched a, a huge agenda, green agenda in the central bank, in which we try to control at least to direct finance to sustainable activities. And that is true on the agriculture. That is also true on the way you finance mining, for example. It's true uh, for small companies. Uh, so we are having this approach of, ha of being uh, uh, mindful that this recovery has to be sustainable. And a lot of the items on our agenda has that component. For example, sharing information re regarding green projects. Um, and you know, to the most important probably, probably will be um, this stage, which I think we are far from reaching, which is trying to find uh, pricing for carbon, which I think is, is a job that's still not done. That's probably the most important one because it's a, it's a correct way to price this externality. And this will link a lot of markets and we will link the private to the public sector. So I would say uh, we are very mindful of that. I think the central bank has an important role together with the government. Um, and we need to understand that this needs to be very inclusive. Thank you. Dilan, would you agree with that forecast about the extent of the structural shifts we're going to see uh, throughout the market economy as a, as a result of COVID? Will, will it act as an accelerant to structural change in the economy? Uh, definitely, I think that uh, you know COVID nineteen uh, is going to accelerate the pace of change and the pace of innovation. Uh, with every business model has to think about the technological aspect of it, and therefore you know it is what you know Charles Schwab says you know terms as the technological reset. So business models are going to change. That pathway to change needs to be thought about very carefully by boards of directors and, and management teams. The sustainable agenda will go forward, it needs to, but the question of course is the pace of adoption because companies have to be able to go along with that journey. So carbon pricing is an important component, but the ability of companies to sustain uh, proper carbon pricing is the, is the big question. And therefore a carbon pricing program which is gradual is, is quite important in order to allow that transition journey to be undertaken by companies. You know, it's interesting that uh, this year's World Economic Forum had as its theme uh, climate change, and it was all the rage at, at, uh, in Davos this year. But the last day of the, of, the, of the forum was also the beginning of the first day of the global effect of, the, of COVID-19, where the first cases in Europe were first reported practically the day after. So the question you have to ask yourself is whether the pandemic is going to slow down the pace of, of adoption by companies of sustainable practices in the context of of uh, climate change and, and climate risk mitigation. Uh, you know, the pace may well slow down initially, but it needs to then pick up. And therefore, public support, public money, as well as private money has to come together to make up the slack somehow. And we need to do that because carbon agreement process uh, requires capital, requires the, uh, the, the uh, provision of capital to decarbonization solutions which are out there. And, and that will actually result in, in more sustainable business models arising in the future. So, so this is a big conundrum that we face today in a COVID-19 world. 
And the most important thing is to figure out when we're going to get out of it, and when we get out of it, what will the post-COVID-19 world look like, or what would, would an extended COVID-19 world uh, look like? And the various things which are important that, in that respect, first of all, uh, the virus resurgence that we see in the United States and, and Europe, and how can that be contained? Uh, and that is very much correlated to the uh, pace of vaccine development. And, and no doubt there are positive news coming out today, as we can see from, the, from how the markets are reacted. But that is important and the availability of that vaccine to, uh, to a broad group of, of, of people is very important because otherwise the, the efficacy of the vaccine development uh, is not going to be seen into the economy and therefore into uh, aspects of society which are, important, which, which are critical. So the government made an important point, which is that society is demanding that, uh, that there's inclusivity and sustainability uh, in the context of what's happening. I think that's, that's going to be there regardless. And, uh, and businesses have to focus on that and not, not take the eye off that long-term goal. And inclusion is very important because social resilience and social cohesion is, is going to be a, a, you know, a key outcome of the responses to the COVID-19 pandemic by governments and companies. And companies have to have a part to play in that, you know, in the promotion of social cohesion and social resilience within the communities in which they operate. So I would say that the sustainability agenda is, is very much still relevant and needs to be focused on by investors like Masik, uh, as well as, by the way, governments and companies. And we have to figure out the right way to, to uh, continue that, that journey and, and the pace of change that comes with it. Dr. Alade, to what extent are you preparing in Nigeria for, for structural change? And to what extent does that involve uh, issues of sustainability and, 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 and climate change? You know, for for us, thank you, Ryan. For us, it's uh, very important because of this uh, uh, dependence on uh, on hydrocarbon, and uh, it's what we have been working on in trying to diversify the economy away from oil. Now that COVID had come, even before COVID, we realized that it is important to have a sustainable business, and we have. Uh, been working on jointly, the government and I think as well as our central bank have been working on having sustainable business uh, uh, environment within the within the economy. Government is also promoting it, and uh, um, I know we'll get to a point where we will be encouraging and giving incentives for businesses that are going to be, um, you know, sustainable. It's it, it's very important, and inclusivity, as has he, as he also mentioned, is important. We have seen that uh, you have a large proportion of the uh, population that are vulnerable to the pandemic, that have uh, issues with uh, poverty, dealing with this. If we have sustainable uh, and inclusive economic growth, we probably will not have it as bad as we do. But yes, with climate change, with uh, issue of uh, having sustainable uh, businesses that are compliant, we are really, really working on it and we're on top of that too. Thank you. Governor Neto, I'd like to uh, ask you a little bit more about the extraordinary policy uh, we've seen this year. Um, in particular, how important uh, has the have the actions of the Federal Reserve in Washington DC been for emerging markets and for Brazil specifically? We saw the opening of a, of a swap line, for instance, to provide dollar liquidity. Uh, has, has that been a, a sort of a central part of the policy response in, in your mind or, or a peripheral one? No, I, I think the, the coordination in policy among central banks is very important for everyone in emerging market countries. And I think the Fed was, uh, ex the, the timing of the Fed was uh, exceptional. Um, they did it very timely uh, in, a, in a big way. Um, and I think it, uh, it contributed to the reversion of the markets alongside uh, Europe came and did, you know, big, you know, big uh, fiscal measures together with a lot of measures from central banks. Central bank in other places also um, contributed to that. I think the, the fact that it was combined Will probably be the the, the highlight of that. Um, 
we actually applied for the swap line. We don't expect it to use as Brazil has around $350 billion in reserves. And actually because of the devaluation reserves, the percent of GDP have increasing a lot lately. So we don't think we, we are going to need to use. I think it's always good to have. It's good to have the partnership with the treasury in the US and to talk to them uh, on, on how we can uh, um, develop this partnership further. Um, I think uh, financial markets are very important for us though. Uh, everything is connected to financial markets in some way. Um, I started describing what was our plan in 2019 uh, and, and, and what it is uh, still our plan uh, and, and that requires a lot of finance from the private side because we are talking about uh, reinventing the country with private money, diminishing the size of the government. Um, when you look at international investments, for example, we had an outflow of 30 billion between March and April. That's, uh, that was eight times higher, seven times higher than what we had in the crisis of 2008, so that you have an idea. So um, we were into this in, in the cycle of losing money from portfolio and getting money um, into the real side of the economy. When you look at convergence of rates in emerging market countries, it usually happens this way. You start losing the portfolio money because your rates are going lower and lower and some of the investors don't have interest anymore. And then eventually you start growing with private money, uh, reinventing yourself, and then you have all the flow to the real side of the economy. The problem of the, the, the COVID is it's got us between one cycle and the other. We had just gone from the cycle of lowering rates and convergency rates into getting the money from the private side and international uh, investors to develop our uh, our infrastructure programs, our you know the real side of the economy. Uh, it starts with brownfield, but eventually gets into greenfield projects, and we wanted to see that. Um, so, in in, our, in in my opinion, it was very important uh, what the Fed did and the connection between between governments and, and the combined action. Um, but it's more important for us the reaction and and the risk appetite coming back than the action itself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dylan, how would you rate as, as an investor, I suppose, the policy response of governments and how important has it been to the economic and, and financial landscape? I think the response of the Fed, as the government mentioned, was exceptional. Um, the way the Fed came in in March and in April to stabilize the financial markets with the support that it provided, much needed monetary stimulus, and that coming together with the fiscal stimulus that we saw in the US in April, in particular the four packages that contributed up to 14% of GDP, was critical in ensuring that, uh, that it didn't have a knock-on effect on the financial markets and in particular the financial system. So that coordinated response between, uh, between fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus was critical to the US. And I would say the same thing happened in the Eurozone uh, with, good with great coordination between fiscal and monetary uh, responses. Uh, by governments and by the ECB. And I think that also contributed to stabilizing the financial markets in the Eurozone as well. And I think that's been important for investors in developed markets and has allowed for um, you know, repricing of, of assets and, and some stabilization in, in, uh, in terms of asset pricing. So that was, critical for, that, that was critical for investors. And we saw that the credit spreads, which had spiked up in March and into, in, sorry, in February and into March, abated significantly right after stimulus was put in place, especially monetary stimulus from the, from the Fed. Uh, and again, that was critical to, uh, to, to companies and, and to, to banks. So I would say that the, that the response was extraordinary. If you consider the response that has been, has been put forward between March and, 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 uh, and now, compared to what was done during the GFC, the speed of response is what was, was very significant. Obviously, there's still more to be done. The, the, the next round of fiscal stimulus in the US is going to be very important. Uh, and, and that has to be seen in the context of the, the resurgence of the virus and the record number of cases which are coming up, which hampers the opening up of, of, of the economies, uh, of the economy in, in the US. The same thing in Europe. And, and you know, you've got to think about whether there's, there's enough uh, you know, fisc fiscal policy space and, 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 and monetary policy space. And, and that's, that's, a, that's an important thing for investors uh, to think about and the long-term effects of, of this of the stimulus programs, especially in the respect of uh, public public debt, but also in the context of the support for household consumption and its impact on the economy and what happens when that starts to taper off, and what's the real long-term uh, employment rate that we're looking at, and therefore that's dependent upon businesses and how businesses will fare coming out of the COVID situation or, or continuing into the COVID situation. 
So these are long-term effects that we have to think about as a long-term investor uh, and, and not just the immediate effects of uh, what we've seen in the last few months. Would you include in that long-term horizon any concerns over the seeming blurring of the line between fiscal and monetary policy around the world? Uh, do you think that the independence of central banks is under threat? I've had it said to me that at the moment, central banks and fiscal authorities find it easy to work hand in hand because they've got uh, the same aims. If the inflation outlook in many countries is, is depressed and governments want to stimulate the economy, but when those interests diverge, perhaps we'll have a bit more tension there. How, how do you see it? I mean, that's, that's always going to be the concern, isn't it? That, uh, that, you, that the independence of central banks is compromised, because that goes to confidence in, in, in the economy, confidence in currency, confidence in trade with the country, and so on. There's so many knock-on effects with that. Um, you know, we're, we're in a highly unusual environment today, one that has not been uh, you know, not not been uh, sort of gone through by any major economy, uh, you know, since since probably World War II, and so we have to see how central banks and governments are able to use the tools they have in a coordinated ma manner, given what they have to do for their economies and for the societies. I mean, that's ultimately at the end of the day, uh, you know, the role of public institutions, and it's not an easy situation because we don't know, uh, you know, what is the shape of of, of of uh, the recovery going to be if, and when the recovery is going to come about. And much is dependent upon things outside the control of public institutions, in particular uh, vaccine development, which is going to be critical in the, in, in the issue of treatment and therefore in the issue of opening up economies and allowing for cross-border trade and the like to continue. So I think these are, big, these are important questions and I don't have an answer for you because it really depends on how the, the virus uh, continues into into 2021 and, and, the, and the responses I, as well as the uh, as the success of vaccine development. I, I'd like to make a comment on that, if it's possible. Um, Please on do. This interaction, on this interaction that you asked, I think it's it's actually more than that. You need to consider that you have executive, you have the legislative, um, and then you have the central bank. And a lot of these measures are passed in the legislative and understand that having coordination uh, to spend money and to be more inclusive is very easy. But on the way out, the exiting strategy and having coordination on the ex exiting strategy is going to be much more difficult. And it's not only between the government and the central bank, but also between the executive and the legislative. And you already see in some countries that this actually goes to the judiciary too. So I think the coordination, the exiting strategies uh, amongst the various institutions, especially emerging market countries, is something that you need to watch very closely. In the case of Brazil, one thing that we did that I think was, uh, uh, was good is everything has a date to end. So every stimulus, everything that was done has a date to end, which is December 31st. And if you need to renew it, you need to vote in Congress again. So I think it's, it's, it's better this way because you kind of already have an exit strategy that is designed. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. One of the things that you uh, ha have not done is deployed at scale the quantitative easing power you have. What would it take for you to, to cross that line? We haven't because uh, Brazil had an extra um, cushion in terms of liquidity that was very big. Our reserve requirement was at 35%, which is much higher than any other country. So we, have so, we had so much liquidity to give to banks and to direct this liquidity through measures that we thought uh, the banks would do, do better, would do this better than the government. Um, there's always that fear. You can, you have to use it. You have to use it. If there is no other way, you can use it. But uh, there's always that fear that you start getting into moral hazard issues. How are we going to buy private credit? Uh, how are we going to evaluate the companies? Uh, you need to think that the central bank. We don't have a department uh, that analyzes credit, so we we need to do it in an auction in a way that is very uh, open to everyone. So we thought, since we had this uh, opportunity of having extra liquidity, that would first exhaust all these measures before thinking on anything else. Thank you. Do Dr. Alade, to what extent are these interaction issues, uh, to what extent are they on the, on the table in Nigeria? And how do you rank the international coordinated economic policy response this year? Sorry, how, how would you rate it? Uh, do, do you think it has been effective? Is there more to do? 
Well, I, I, I think it's been very effective. The fact that it's a coordinated thing, which was what we, you know, in the past, that's always been what we cry for, that's the, the intervention. I mean, central banks should work together rather than, you know, work at uh, uh, cross purposes or work at different uh, wavelengths. So I think for the uh, COVID-19, the intervention this time has been very effective. There's been liquidity in the uh, the financial markets, hasn't been stopped. And uh, like the governor did say, these are things that we have seen. And we do hope that uh, in future, when there are issues like this, there will be this type of uh, cooperation as well. Yes, there are issues. There will be exits. Like, like, like we have said, there will be problems with exiting some of these uh, uh, quantitative easing that has been done and occasionally, or, or most of the time countries will have to look at their own situation uh, uh, first before they look at the global uh, thing. But I, I, I believe it's been very, very effective. To what extent are you viewing the inflation outlook and in, in particular the pressure on the currency as the most important economic constraint uh, from a policymaking perspective or are there other ones? Uh, uh, for Nigeria or globally? Oh, for for, for Nigeria, about? but also globally. For Nigeria, there are, there will be inflation. We have, we have issues that uh, some other countries do not uh, have. We have just talked about the the the, the lower uh, revenue that we have. We have talked about. I mean, there are issues with uh, 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 the the inflation inflationary outlook now. For Nigeria, is still uh, a bit high, higher than what it is in most other economies. So we do have all that, in, and uh, we have all the intervention from central bank as well as uh, the the fiscal authorities to to be able to contain the the COVID. Yes, we have inflationary pressures, and globally too. Um, globally, is the other way around. They are having a, a lower inflation than what they had expected will be, but we are having it higher because of uh, some of the supply shock that we do have. So you do have different uh, kind of things, but we are also managing. And I believe that uh, very soon we begin to see some of the positive uh, things that we hoped for. Thank you. And how, how, much, how much do you think, perhaps Governor Neto, this might be one for you, how much do you think today's news on the vaccine might change the economic policy that we see over the next six months to a year? Or does it not? Was this already baked in? Before that, if I can make a comment on inflation, because I think it's very relevant for emerging oh, yeah. markets. Yeah. I, I think we, we are basically seeing um, an increase from food prices. There are some other items, but a lot of it is food prices. And I think it has three dimensions. One is commodity prices and, and the devaluation that some of the countries had in the, in the currency. And Brazil had a devaluation of 40%. So the first one is linked to FX and the persistence of the devaluation, not only the devaluation, but the persistence. The second one has to do with uh, what we call a substitution effect from uh, precautionary savings going into eating more food at home. So if you're not going to movies, you're not traveling, um, you transfer that to consumption of food. And we're seeing that too. And I think the last one is the income transfer programs that are very, very uh, big and they're very uh, uh, tilted towards the low income population. And we are seeing a lot of consumption of items uh, from those uh, people that are getting the, the program. So I would say these three dimensions and they're present in some of the countries in emerging market country, in emerging market space. Uh, as to the vaccine, I, I think it's, 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 it's going to be critical. We just saw today in the first hour, half an hour of markets what the markets have done. Uh, on the speculation of uh, of a vaccine. Um, the market starts to worry about whether this virus is gonna change into something else. There were news in some countries in Europe that they were finding different kinds or different ways of mutations of the virus. I think it's it's still, uh, you know, a wait and see, but I think the vaccine is what will change the game definitely. So I would say, yes, that that's a game changer. Yeah, I'm going to give you the last word here. Any closing thoughts on on that and on the on what you expect from economic policy in the next six months to a year? Um, well, I think first of all, you know, the markets are very focused on an effective vaccine or effective vaccines being made available. 
And I think that's the most important thing because that actually gives confidence to governments and to uh, and to companies and to and to society that there is uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and policy will will be very much calibrated by by that issue. And uh, you know, the longer we have to wait for an effective vaccine and for that vaccine to be made available in quantities that can uh, that can uh, you know um, help it globally. Um, the, you know, the more we would have to rely on extraordinary measures uh, to get through this, uh, this difficult uh, uh, environment that we're in. And that means more risks. And when there are more risks, of course, uh, you know, they, 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 it will have an impact on investors and, and sentiment and, and market performance and the like. But the markets will perform in one way. The underlying business is very, very critical. And so if we don't find a way in which we can get out of the situation, and the real economy is, is not sustained, then that has significant knock-on effects that uh, governments will find very difficult uh, to deal with uh, you know, uh, for a sustainable period of time. And I think that's why the vaccine development is, is, is so important for us to, to focus on and to try to, to understand. And, and by the way, the government is right. I mean, we have to understand the virus as well. You know? And that's, of course, an issue of science. And we have to pay attention to the science. Well, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Thank you uh, for that. And thank you to all our panelists for, for a great discussion. And I think if you hang on, the next session is going to be Spotlights, Investing in the Underinvested. Uh, and I'm pleased to hand off to that now.